Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right. Just make sure that everything is set up well. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here in Abu Dhabi to deliver one of the lectures in the Environment in the Middle East, Middle East series. I would like to start by thanking my colleague, my dear colleague, Maurice Pomeranz, for his kind invitation to present in the lecture series, and my dear colleague, Justin Stearns, for his generous introduction and for our ongoing collaboration. My thanks also go to Nahid Ahmed, who has masterfully uh, taken care of all the uh, travel and logistics related issues. And of course, I would like to thank the um, NYU Abu Dhabi Institute. My lecture this evening will be on the legacy of past pandemics. And of course, I will start out by having all of us think about the current day pandemic and use it as a case to question some of our assumptions and some of our ways of thinking, patterns of thinking about past pandemics, because I believe that, well, the COVID-19 pandemic, the elephant in the room, right, is still with us today. As we see the numbers just from today, uh, more than six and a half million people died since the onset of this pandemic. I will not go into the reasons of why the international community failed miserably during this pandemic keep for keeping COVID-19 in check. And um, the overall death count is already a testament to um, our failure globally. Um, and you know, it's, it's a sobering truth that we need to face. Uh, but my lecture today will address specifically how we think about pandemics, past, or present, and I will um, and I will try to emphasize why I think it's important to um, to assess where we are today with respect to the current pandemic, and to underline the relevance of history, in particular how we think about past, uh, how we think about the past matters in how we understand the present and how we imagine the future. And I will try to demonstrate using the history of pandemics and discussing their lasting legacy, that it is a very um, a timely concern for us, for our ongoing uh, present day concerns. But at the same time, I would like to underline the critical importance of the medieval Middle East and the Mediterranean world, and in also uh, the post-medieval Middle East as well. So we'll start with a little background information on plague and its history, and a little bit of uh, the issues of periodization, and just introducing some terms that we use commonly in the history of pandemics, um, and a few just a brief summary about the biology of the disease plague, right? And the Middle East and um, the, the, the Middle East, the medieval Middle East and the larger Mediterranean world experienced a series of epidemics and um, endemic diseases uh, throughout its history. But the two most disruptive pandemics of plague of the pre-modern world are the, the so-called Justinianic plague, the first plague pandemic, and the second plague pandemic, which is commonly referred to as the Black Death, even though the Black Death is the onset of the second pandemic. Each of these outbreaks or epidemics started out a new disease regime that affected large uh, regions, including the Middle East, and the, um, we have the ongoing effects of these long durée with disease regimes um, over, over um, a very long period of time, which also incorporates the modern period. And uh, again, very briefly, I'll try to introduce plague as a, a bacterial infection um, caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis that um, attacks lymph nodes in the body, usually causing inflammation and producing painful swellings in the groin area, in the armpits, and or the neck, 
called buboes, the typical um, symptom, a characteristic symptom of bubonic plague. In some cases, the bacteria can infect the lungs and cause pneumonic plague and can be transferred from person to person by infected droplets spread in the air as a result of coughing or sneezing. But the default form of the disease is the bubonic form, which is not something that can be transferred from person to person. Essentially, a disease of rodents, bubonic plague, is can sometimes spill over to humans via infected fleas or other um, vectors and can cause them to develop a serious infection that can result in severe complications and often death. In its default bubonic form, the mortality is anywhere between 40 to 70 percent, while in the pneumonic form, it can be a fatal con condition that can kill within 24 hours if not treated promptly with antibiotics. And contrary to common perception, plague is not an extinct disease. And I think I'm going too fast with the slides. It's not an extinct disease, and it's still very much alive in certain parts of the world, including the southwestern United States, see on the map, parts of Central Asia and parts of Africa, where the disease is enzootic, that is to say it continues to live among the rodent populations of these regions and can sometimes spill over to human populations. If anything, human cases of plague have been on the rise recently. Since 2019, frequent cases of bubonic plague have been reported in Mongolia and more recently in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And if there are any questions about the biology of plague, we can always go back to these um, details um, about the biology and epidemiology of plague later on during the Q&A. So, but let me just go on for now. Both the so-called first and the second pandemic left a deep imprint, so I'm referring to the Justinianic plague and the Black Death, left a deep imprint in medieval Middle East the medieval Middle East and the medieval um, Mediterranean societies in general, and transforming them irreversibly. But how do we study such epidemic episodes of the past? Where is our attention focused and what are our blind spots? And how do we rethink the legacy of past pandemics? These are some of the questions that I would like to address tonight. In this present age of pandemics, it is critical to rethink how we write that history with a conviction that the past helps us to understand the present and the present should help us rethink the past, I turn to past plagues and the legacy they left behind. So my presentation takes stock of the lasting legacies of past plagues because they continue to shape the way we think about new pandemics as here I have just a few brief visual tastes of the kinds of moments we've had since the beginning of the, the pandemic, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, but also more recently during the Ebola pandemic. So our present day pandemics always measured against some past pandemics. And among these, I will argue that the Black Death occupies a very central place. Here I will first situate some of the broader historiographical parameters that informed the study of past pandemics in the last few decades. And my goal is to stress that the reflexive discussion of past pandemics as short-term cataclysmic events must be replaced by a broader, more realistic vision that recognizes that pandemics are long-term processes. And just to underline that, two and a half years into this current day pandemic, I think we've all developed a sense that we are in a process. Perhaps in the earlier days of this pandemic, we imagined the COVID-19 pandemic as an event, but now going through its several phases, we are developing an insight into what it, mean, what it means to live in an age of pandemics and why it is better understood and imagined as a long-term process than an event. And for that purpose, 
it's important to have a longer multi-century time scale that facilitates detecting the ebb and flow of diseases over the long durée, whether we're dealing with the past or we're thinking about the present. What I will try to emphasize today is that we need to shift our focus beyond epidemic episodes or of crises, disruptions or collapse to better understand how past societies learned to live with diseases and the processes by which they developed the means of resilience and adaptation in facing them. In both cases, the medieval Middle East and the Mediterranean world would serve as an excellent case in point with a rich repository of historical experiences. Against this backdrop, I will then turn to the legacy, the lasting legacy of past plagues and address persisting problems such as European exceptionalism, triumphalism, and epidemiological orientalism that are not only ubiquitous in the historical scholarship, but also staples of public opinion about pandemics, past and present. So we'll start with a little background on some of the recent debates for the history of climatic and environmental um, interruptions and disruptions and collapse versus uh, resilience debates very briefly. In the last decade or two, pressing global issues such as global warming, environmental degradation, habitat destruction, and loss of biodiversity have raised gro growing concerns and led to de divisive debates, not only in the public domain and among policymakers, but also among scholars in the natural sciences and humanities alike. One approach that seems to have achieved prominence is the concept, concept of collapse or societal collapse. In 1988, the American anthropologist Joseph Tainter published a book called The Collapse of Complex Societies, which examined three historical societies, the Western Roman Empire, the Maya civilization, and the Cao cul uh, culture as case studies in Tainter's analysis. Societal collapse was not caused by what is typically understood as environmental crisis, such as crop failures, famines, and epidemics, but rather by economic crisis. The concept of collapse or societal collapse stirred important discussions among anthropologists, historians, sociologists, and political scientists. In 2005, the American polymath Jared Diamond published his book, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, as a direct response to the concept of societal collapse, in which he emphasized resilience and societal transformation instead. Diamond's book was also criticized, especially by historians and archaeologists, which led some to adopt newer approaches by either rejecting collapse or catastrophe and developing new frameworks of study beyond it. And I should also emphasize that some of these debates have also spilled over into um, or to the discussions about past pandemics. Further debates about collapse versus resilience have become prominent recently, especially in archaeology and paleosciences, in uh, paleoclimatology, especially in paleopathology, and new research techniques became available to study past societies and new societies revealed closer details of death and destruction caused by environmental and anthropogenic crisis. Researchers offered a wide spectrum of interpretations ra ranging from societal collapse to resilience and transformation. But most of the time, these controversies don't manifest themselves as a smooth conversation or spectrum, rather they're extremely um, controversial. New research coming out on the late Bronze Age collapse, for example, between 12, uh, circa 1200 to 1100 BCE, involving multiple regions across the Eastern Mediterranean, parts of the Middle East as well, including where we're yeah, currently looking at as the heart of the um, important regions um, for the history of plague as well. But uh, at the same time, uh, other historical cases have also been brought into this conversation to, into focus, such as the fall of the Roman Empire, Mesoamerican Maya civilization, or the Angkor civilization in Southeast Asia. All of these receiving scholar attention uh, with different interpreta differing interpretations, right? While collapse and resilience offered novel interpretations or interpretive frameworks, the binary, 
and the controversy divided the scholarship into opposing camps. The division is perhaps nowhere more visible than in pandemic studies, as I briefly mentioned before, which has recently become a site, or rather a battleground, for conflicting academic approaches. I will discuss the specific debates about the impact of collapse versus resilience in the study of past pandemics in a few minutes. But before I do that, I'd like to trace back all the older forms of pandemic thinking that inform these modern dichotomies, which would require taking a quick glance at the 19th century because this was the beginning of modern scholarship, modern historical scholarship of plague pandemics. So I am taking you to the 1830s just to set the framework for the modern day debates um, and controversies between collapse and resilience. So the 19th century German medical historian, Frederick Karl Hecker, and his followers later on established the, the, the broad uh, contours of this body of scholarship, historical scholarship on past pandemics. In fact, from coining the term, the Black Death itself, to developing a sense of what some historians refer to as a Gothic epidemiology, setting the broader emotional context of past pandemics and pandemic narratives. Hecker published his uh, Black Death in the 14th century, originally published in, in German in 1832, then translated into in, uh, English and other languages. He was a physician, um, a practicing physician in Berlin, and was interested in all aspects of plague. Its history, along with its origins, causes, spread, treatment, and he wanted to establish disease as a force in human history. So that was the, the main motivation in writing that book. It was a spectacular success. Hecker's book um, tra first translated into English and then went through multiple editions and translations to Italian, Dutch, French, leading to Hecker being recognized in Europe as the foremost authority on historical epidemiology. In fact, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to call him as the or his book as the onset of historical epidemiology in the 19th century, even though there were predecessors to um, his, his uh, line of scholarship. The multiple editions and translations of Hecker's work indeed transformed the Black Death and historical epidemiology into a captivating field of study in historical scholarship for the rest of the 19th century, carrying with it not only the term Black Death, which didn't exist before, but also the historical imagination of it. Hecker's particular treatment of the subject set the emotional tone of almost all later historical scholarship on the Black Death. I should say things are gradually changing now, but his influence has been relevant for a very long time, more um, nearly for two centuries. And I recently wrote um, a chapter on why is black that black and questioning um, Hecker's influence and also setting my interest in the question of the legacy of past pandemics. And as you see here, the emphasis here will be on the black death and black death narratives through which we hopefully will be able to read some of our um, assumptions about past pandemics and how they are still with us today. So the broader intellectual context that informed Hecker's work is sought to be sought in 19th century European Romanticism. This was a time when academic history started to develop, especially pioneered by German universities, and many of the examples produced during this period adopted the romantic approach to history. In particular, these works share in common a tendency to glorify the past, to employ emotions and a fair degree of individualism and even heroism in historical narratives. Beyond this intellectual context, the most immediate historical factor that informed Hecker's work was the global cholera pandemic that first hit Europe in the 1830s. That's exactly when he started working on um, the Black Death book. In the decades that followed, outbreaks of cholera have repeatedly affected Europe much like the rest of the world, and caused a great number of deaths. It was not only before, it was, it was, excuse me, it was not long before cholera spread that uh, was understood to be associated 
Let me repeat, it was not long before cholera spread was understood to be associated with water, which made sanitation the main focus of discussions about epidemic diseases. This was a time when epidemiological and sanitary anxieties intensified everywhere in Europe with ramifications in medicine and policy making per pertaining to public health, border control, and um, other public health measures. Other medical authors of the 19th century and early 20th century developed the basic tenets of historical epidemiology and helped lay the foundations of the Bergen and field of modern scientific epidemiology. So in fact, historical epidemiology precedes the modern science of epidemiology and there are interesting continuation, continuities and parallels between them. August Hurst, uh, again writing uh, in the 19th century, um, wrote um, the German uh, book, later translated into English, Handbook of Historical and Geographical Pathology, and also Charles Crichton, writing in um, A History of Epidemics in Britain, among the most prominent examples of the, the historical um, epidemiologist of the 19th and early 20th century. And um, in the historical plague narratives, and kind of emerging from these, the writings of Hecker and his followers, Plague, specifically, and pandemic disease generally came to be seen as a force of nature that shaped societies. That was the initial goal for Hecker and later on continued. And here you're probably seeing the first um, interventions I'm trying to make on the debate on collapse versus resilience in the context of pandemic. So we're tracing how this theme of disease as a force of nature was developing since the 19th century. These scholars essentially promoted the idea of environmental determinism. The Gothic tenor, the stress on death, let me also show some images to go with the, the emotional tone of, um, of uh, 19th century style historical epidemiology and discussions of plague. The Gothic tenor, the stress on death, disease, destruction, and despair, attributing a greater agency to disease in history and a diminished one to humans. Imagining disease as an alien, mysterious, almost unexplainable supernatural force on human society, even one that has the power to determine their fate, always for the worse, leading to catastrophic scenarios. Hecker emphasized the morbid and bizarre aspects of the Black Death, exclusive to Western Europe, such as the flagellants movement and the Jewish pogroms. But um, his obsession with, um, but just let me very briefly add, and even though these uh, narratives, uh, those historical elements that are exclusive to Western Europe have become staples of black death narratives over a very long period of time, even though they were only um, products of um, Western Europe during the medieval period. But uh, Hecker's obsession with the morbid and bizarre aspects of um, history, in line with the 19th century imagination of medieval history in, in general, uh, images of the Danse Macabre, uh, Dance of the Death, Dead individuals from all walks of life are depicted as coming together to dance, typically, in these uh, images. Similarly, allegoric allegorical references to death, the closeness of the hour of death, and elaborate descriptions of death can be found equally commonly in literary and historical works, poetry, and hagiographies, a certain fascin fascination with death, as illustrated in Hecker's Gothic epidemiology, seems to be reminiscent of the robust European tradition of writing about death since the time of the Black Death. So there are certain cultural uh, and artistic and literary continuities um, to uh, continuing from the time of the Black Death that kind of spilled over into the writings of uh, the historical epidemiologists of the 19th century. So this Gothic epidemiology, though seemingly less prominent today than it was in the 19th century, and in the 19th and early 20th century historical scholarship, still defines both scholarly and popular understandings of plague. Historical scholarship textbooks and works for the general public on the Black Death 
are still represented to a large extent by the iconic imagery of the, the Gothic epidemiology and the Danse Macabre. And I'm sure you've seen this image or something like this many times since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, images of the Grim Reaper, um, iconic ima image of the plague doctor, right, have become staples of this, um, the narrative, and of course, ironically, the plague doctor on uh, the bottom image was not a medieval phenomenon, it's a 17th century introduction. Uh, but these, these images have become staple images of, um, of the black death narratives and black death imaginaries. The historical imagination positioned past pandemics as short-term cataclysmic mysterious events that we have little control over. This is certainly recognizable to many of us in this room today as this was how the COVID-19 pandemic was first understood. And of course, this way of thinking about pandemics is not one that is supported by scientific thinking, as emerging infectious diseases are preventable phenomena. In the popular imagination, pandemics are often regarded as short-term cataclysmic events or isolated exceptional outbursts that do not last longer than a few months or years. And perhaps we should still question our own way of thinking about our current day pandemic. But this particular imagination that renders pandemics almost ahistorical is a recent construct drawing on disaster studies of studying like volcano eruptions, earthquakes, tornadoes, and tsunamis, and especially used in popular books and films. In the media, pandemics are now depicted as freak accidents of nature in which humans are the ultimate victims. To add a touch of sensationalism to all that, they're even shown as a mysterious disease or as mysterious diseases that inevitably destroy human societies. And in fact, you know, contagion is, is a very successful example of its uh, kind. But uh, you come across this type of approach um, in, in popular um, examples, the mysterious disease that's they inevitably destroy human societies, inspiring fantasies of post-apocalyptic futures. Like sadly, this particular imagination of pandemics, the Hollywood style, is the pro predominant impression among the general public. Pandemics are depict depicted as apocalyptic, but brief episodes in pandemic movies. This line of thinking easily gives way to denial, which is something that we've experienced um, in certain parts of the world since the beginning of the pandemic. Also very briefly on the issue of pandemics or plague as products of a Eurocentric historiography. This is something that is heavily and deeply related to leg legacies of colonialism and Orientalism. In the spirit of what I call epidemiological Orientalism, which I define as the totality of discursive practices whereby Western Europeans viewed, experienced, imagined, reproduced, and represented the Oriental healthscape as the perennially plague-stricken other, as the diseased uh, landscape. European epidemiologists continue to imagine plague as an Oriental disease and the Orient as the source of the Black Death and by extension of all plagues. This is a very persistent way of thinking, which I would argue is still with us today. Heckert wrote, wrote, for example, doubtless it is the nature which has done the most to banish the Oriental plague from Western Europe, where the increasing cultivation of the earth and the advancing order in civilized society prevented it from remaining domesticated, which it most probably had been in the it had been there in the more ancient times. So the Euro European exceptionalism is, is very, very prevalent. In this teleology, the Black Death becomes a twist of fate, a challenge to be overcome by the European society and hence celebrated as an integral element, uh, integral component to its history and its civilizational supremacy. In the words of the 20th century medievalist David Hurley, Plague presented a multifarious challenge to European society, but, and I quote, it also prepared the road to renewal. 
Europe proved to be a strong patient and emerged from its long bout with pestilence healthier, more energetic, and more creative than before." End quote. I should also add that despite the influence of this 19th century historiography, where the series counter narratives that started to emerge toward the end of the 20th century are also important to um, take into consideration. This was also a time that witnessed a dramatic expansion of historical research that sought not only to cover the lives, uh, that, that, that sought not only to cover the lives of the elite, but those of the ordinary people, peasants, workers, women, and marginalized groups, but also, uh, and, and the significance of their suffering, disease, and death. Um, new sensibilities in historical research, largely powered by the influence of the Annal School, in early 20th century and throughout the, for the rest of the 20th century, helped historical foster an interest in plague and other diseases. The novel emphasis on the environment and the longue durée were also heavily influential in shaping the plague historiography during the 1970s. And I think I'm missing some slides here. Okay, my apologies. A new search in the history of disease publications was pioneered by historians such as Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie, William McNeil, Alfred Crosby, Jacques Le Goff, Jean-Noël Brebin. Starting in the 60s and 70s, we see the influential works of these historians on history of disease and plague has been always an important uh, disease for um, these uh, historians producing these foundational studies. The works of these historians not only established disease as a legitimate actor in historical studies, meriting academic study for its own sake, but also opened up new possibilities for their exploration in trans-regional, hemispheric, and global context. Studies on the history of plague and other epidemic diseases began to grow exponentially in the following decades, and the medieval Middle East and the Mediterranean world have been an important area of focus for these studies, also the primary sort, uh, site of historiographical contentions. And Justin's reminding me about time here. No? no? Okay. So I was thinking whether I should skip a little of my talk. No, we're good, right? Okay. So um, thinking about why the medieval Middle East and the Mediterranean world in particular has been an important site in these controversies and how we can think about um, the, the centrality of plague and past pandemics of plague in these debates. I think I have um, a few comments about this. So we're talking about the legacy of past pandemics. And in fact, I would call it a toxic legacy that informed our historical thinking about past pandemics. But this is also helpful or identifying the toxic elements of these narratives um, are important to it's important to identify its lasting effects, especially I'm here referring to a divided Mediterranean in terms of its uh, historical epidemiology. Typically in these studies, you see the Western and Eastern ends of the Mediterranean as uh, being imagined as different epidemiological zones, right? Here, I'm specifically referring to how the plague, historical plague scholarship has seen Europe and the Middle East as different entities in terms of their um, epidemiological experiences, but also their responses to um, epidemic diseases. Plague scholarship of the Mediterranean world, the larger Mediterranean world, is hardly a subfield that can be treated as a cohesive um, area because it is divided, the scholarship itself is divided because the region has been imagined as um, different, different, essentially different um, epidemiological regions. Uh, the last 15 years of plagues recorded history, and here I'm referring to a time period that involves both the first pandemic and the second pandemic, so largely speaking from the late antique world to the modern era, these geographical areas, 
and especially the difference between Europe and the Middle East is something that is very prominent in um, the study of plague in the historical um, scholarship. So examinations of outbreaks of plague in the Mediterranean basin and its hinterland, including the Middle East, North Africa, um, but also extending to regions of southern Europe, the Black Sea, Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf should rather be treated as a larger geographical disease zone, but this is not the case for much of the historical um, scholarship. And, um, and this has several different historiographical reasons which I'm not going to go into now, but let me briefly mention that um, the, uh, the language of study, though, of the sources, has been one that determined the, 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 the different lines of scholarship in, in this area. So the point that I'm trying to make is basically is that we're dealing with a larger disease zone that people share the same diseases, and shared similar responses, yet we study them as completely distinct zones of disease. And here, more specifically, I'm referring to the Islamic world and Europe, situated geographically on each end of the Mediterranean, but uh, also meeting and overlapping in, in many respects, that these, were, these regions were long imagined as re regions whose epidemiological experiences were radically different from one another. Right? The larger Mediterranean world was treated as a divided epidemiological system, one end being separate or different from the other. These regions do, however, represent a unified disease pool. The larger Mediterranean world, which inherently included the Islamic world, functioned not only as a shared epidemiological environment, but also as a shared intellectual space. The entire region was heir to a shared body of knowledge that people used to respond to shared diseases. Even though the historiography consciously separates an epidemiologically unified Mediterranean and the experience of people who inhabited either ends of it, there is compelling to study this region as, as a whole. So having discussed the Black Death historiography, its origins, evolution, legacy, um, in the historical scholarship of the 19th century, but also studies of the late antique er era and studies on the first pandemic, um, we can now turn to, um, to more recent historical scholarship on how these are um, studied, especially with the input coming from the paleo sciences. Especially in, in, in the last couple of decades, um, researchers from archaeology, paleogenetics, paleoecology, paleoclimatology have joined or um, intervened into these um, con conversations or debates about the history of pandemics, especially on plague has been kind of the centerpiece of these um, debates and, and discussions. And just to briefly outline the studies on the first pandemic, um, generally divided among the more conventional lineages of historical scholarship, most prominently you have distinctions between the Islamicists, the Byzantinists, scholars of the Latin West, but the Mediterranean basin itself as, as a disease zone remained more or less the focal point of the geographical attention and a central thread uniting these historians. Uh, but this controversy, especially in the recent years among, um, among the Okay, now I realize I skipped over these. Okay, now we're caught up, and I apologize. Um, in recent years, a bitter controversy arose in first pandemic studies, that's just neonic plague studies, among the demographic impact of the, uh, the pandemic, fueled in part by an emerging revision scholarship that calls into question the previous scholarship's assessment of the pandemic's impact. The controversy primarily revolves around binary pandemic imaginaries, such as catastrophe versus resilience, or maximalist versus minimalist interpretations of that impact. The controversy, still ongoing, stems from a basic disagreement about whether the Justinianic plague and its recurrent waves were indeed a catastrophic blow to late antique society that brought about monumental long-term changes. 
right? Differences in interpretation of the sources, both textual and non-textual, along with the endemic challenge of the dearth of contemporary sources, leave the field vulnerable to irreconcilable approaches. To overcome the problems of this historiography, historians of the medieval Mediterranean and historians of the Middle East can now turn to studying Another form of, of legacy pandemics leave behind can uh, not when we not only one we can glean from historical sources, but one that affects population genetics of the Mediterranean to this day, a biological legacy of, of in the case of plague, we have uh, recent studies showing that the genetic disease called familial Mediterranean femur, fever, FMF in short, originally emerged as a, emerged as a protection from plague. And this is very recent uh, research that proved this as a biological legacy of past uh, plagues. As such, FMF is especially prevalent among Armenian, Jewish, Turkish, and Arab populations of the, the Eastern Mediterranean region of the, the, the Middle East. More specifically, it affects one to three people per thousand in the Turkish population, but the gene mutation that causes MF, FMF occurs is, is itself more prevalent. One in six people in Turkey, for example, that's about 17% of the population carries this genetic mutation. To understand why the gene mutation that caused this disease occurred, it's necessary to look at plague outbreaks that affected the Middle Eastern and uh, Mediterranean communities for very long centuries. In this case, the gene, the gene mutation that leads to FMF usually gives individuals resistance to Yersinia pestis, the bacterium that causes plague. In other words, this genetic mutation emerges as a kind of defense mechanism in societies that have been exposed to plague for many centuries. It continues to be passed down from generation to generation as an inherited genetic trait among these populations, even in the absence of plague over recent generations, right? We no longer have outbreaks of, of plague in uh, the larger uh, Middle Eastern and Eastern Mediterranean world, but we still have the legacy of past pandemics continuing in, in, in populations. It's a living proof of how the lived experience of a past disease transformed the immunological landscape of a society with ramifications for the present. Just to try to wrap up by way of conclusion, and I know I dealt with um, different threads of this conversation, dealt with different issues, and in fact, I skipped over one little uh, bit, which if I can take a few minutes to, uh, to um, go back to, when I was talking about the epidemiological orientalism and how um, the knowledge about plague and the response to plague itself, something that Western European scholars orientalized, uh, just wanted to show this as, um, in fact, as one of the best examples of how um, Western European scholarship um, anchored plague in, in the oriental landscape. Here um, we have, uh, okay, I'll have to go turn back to read it, just uh, this is from the entry on um, the Enlightened Encyclopedia, and um, the entry on the plague says, and I quote here, all the plagues that have, been, that have appeared in Europe in the last 2,000 years have been transmitted through communication of the Saracens, Arabs, Moors, or Turks with us, and none of our plagues had any other source. Right? It's a very clear articulation of how um, in the 18th century we have this, this very prominent idea that plague comes from the East. It comes from Oriental people. It comes from Muslim populations, right? And already starting in the 18, um, in, seven, in the 1720s with the plague of Marseille, this idea was becoming mainstream, but we see how in the second half of the 18th century, it's already, it, may, it, may, it made its way to um, the Encyclopédie, and then from then on, it kind of spills into uh, more popular um, um, uh, writings. And um, in conjunction with this is, of course, um, the image of the, uh, the dying men of Europe, the sick men of Europe, and of course in the 19th century, it 
acquires a whole new political meaning, meaning but associations with disease and the, the disease of a of society and empire is something that is very uh, prominent. And just a few minutes to emphasize the importance of, of uh, this image, again, going back to um, epidemiological orientalism, perhaps this is the best visual articulation of what this encyclopedia states as like plague or disease comes from the the um, from, comes from Oriental society. So you see the stark contrast in the visual articulation of uh, the disciplined soldiers of of, of Napoleon and the locals um, just being depicted as as sickly, uh, almost inhuman appearances. This is supposed to depict a scene of uh, Napoleon visiting um, Jaffa, uh, which actually in reality never, never happened. Okay, I can go back to my conclusion. Um, so I would like to say that how we know and how we remember past pandemics matters, not just for history's sake, the poorly remembered past can be deadly in the present, as I think we've seen so far, and I hope we will not no longer see in the same, same manner. The perennial Eurocentric and, and colonialist uh, pandemic narratives are exactly those that hinder our ability to study modern pandemics, blocking promising lines of investigation, just as dangerously they're also generating racist, xenophobic disease narratives, making, making effective response even more difficult in certain cases. It might resonate with us that modern historical scholarship on plague and other epidemic diseases started in the 1830s in Europe in the context of cholera pandemics. Thus, each pandemic kind of prompting a new flurry of, of research and publications, um, which is exactly the same, same thing happening um, today. Over the last two centuries, historical epidemiology grew into a prolific field of scholarship, but it bears remembering that the basic tenets of that body of scholarship remains mostly Eurocentric and colonialist in nature which is to say explicitly based on the idea of the supremacy of European society and its cultural hegemony over non-European societies. The Europeanist plague scholarship that recycles older disease narratives continues that Orientalist and xenophobic legacy, despite the fact that most of its tropes have been thoroughly debunked until now. But knowing the real history matters now more than ever, perhaps, when racist myths can kill as much as any pandemic. Perhaps the only silver lining to the COVID-19 pandemic has been an upsurge in research interest in pandemic studies, both past and present. Already there's a flurry of new works that you might notice. More books will be coming out on the Black Death um, soon. And this, this new uh, body of scholarship tackling different aspects of pandemics, in, also in the, um, the humanities, also social sciences, but also um, natural sciences. Studying pandemics require asking the right questions to understand why people are affected differently and why they respond to biological crises in different ways. Comparative historical knowledge helps us to understand the social and cultural context for human responses, which is often missing in biomedical and health research. Understanding that this is the primary context in which pandemics unfold is thus critical for developing appropriate policy in real time. And I think we've seen many examples that demonstrate the case since the onset of our current day pandemic. Simply put, the insights that the social sciences and humanities can offer are crucial for guiding global public health initiatives, especially in a time of pandemics, and must be incorporated into biomedical and health sciences research going forward. And here, I hope I at least made my case about demonstrating why history matters, why it matters that we adopt the right frame of mind, the right uh, patterns of thinking about past pandemics, 
they themselves have a history. Those narratives have themselves embedded in a historical context. They're the products of a certain mindset and an and era. But we no longer need to recycle or repeat them as they are as we need to develop our new insights into being more critical and adopting um, social sciences and humanities perspective to understand both our present day pandemic and thinking about uh, past pandemics. And I think that's what I was hoping to share with you this evening. Thank you.